I'd have eaten the eyeballs. What's wrong with you? Hello and welcome back to Prime Video Club, a welcome distraction from the monotony of self-isolation, I'm sure. If you're anything like me, you've been counting the pigeons on the balcony and watching the washing machine go around. So it's really nice that even though we're all six feet apart at all times, we can be united in our love of watching stuff together. This week, the show we're looking at is sci-fi, Tales from the Loop. And we will also be talking about cult classic Pan's Labyrinth. Clearly, the monster holding the eyeballs did not get the memo that you're not supposed to touch your face right now. So in the words of the evil captain, but with slightly more sincerity. Bienvenidos. And in order to help us with that, we've got Manu Chihuahua with us. Yes. Hazel, welcome back into my boudoir. Clanny <laughs> McClanterson is I so excited to see you again. I thought there might be more this week, but No, but no. do you know what? <laughs> there's some sort of there's some sort of romantic chemistry between my plant and your flowers. So I'm, I'm actually excited to see where that goes this series. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that could develop. It could be interesting. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's tough times over here, Hazel. I mean, look, I am not a cap wearer. Look, Hazel, if I took off my cap right now, yes. I'd give you a run for your money when it comes to horror films, I'll tell you that. Oh, what a nice segue, because we're talking about a bit of horror today, actually. We are, yeah. We are going to be talking about Pan's Labyrinth in just a little bit, but we're going to kick off with Tales from the Loop. We're now to begin. The first thing that really struck me about it is it's beautiful. And I think that's kind of... Probably my favorite thing about the show, that's the thing that really, really grabbed me and kept me was I just, I wanted to be kind of looking at it. I just wanted to kind of I soak agree. it up with my eyeballs. It's so pretty. I would love to explain what the loop is. As far as I can make out, it is a machine that was built to unlock and explore the mysteries of the universe. That is also my Tinder bio, actually. <laughs> This first episode, we've got a, a young girl in this sort of remote town, uh, covered in snow. Everything feels quite isolated, quite separate, <laughs> very topical. Her mother is a scientist. We get the vibe that there's something sort of strange going on in this town. Her mother's working on something, some, uh, some science base underground. There's so much um, negative space, like there's so much time in between the dialogue. It really allows the show to, to breathe. This show somehow manages to make you feel cold. I think it's meant to get you in your feels and it's meant to feel melancholic, if you'll excuse my French. Hey! Ooh! <laughs> Ooh, he's bringing out the big gun this week. <laughs> there is a moment where the same little girl we've seen just walking back from school without a care in the world is now walking back to her home. It's quite a sad setup because she's cooked dinner the night before, she's taken the bin out this morning, she's made her mother coffee. You get the sense that this kid is mothering her mother. Your mother will be proud. And she's, she's already had to be a mother at a young age, which then, which then ties in really nicely to what we get later in the episode. The scene we saw earlier sets up this geography so beautifully. We know the wind chimes, we know the bin, we know, you know the path for this house is, we know the robot just out in the forest. And the house is gone. Look at that space. The house is gone! That's and when it's you just fully little... grasp. How? How does a house that big go missing the across the course of, of five lessons? Yeah. And it's crazy that the only thing left over is mm -hmm. a shard of the rock her mum was wrongly experimenting on the night before. Mama! Almost like yeah. a symbol yeah. to her saying, yeah, your mumsy done bad. Mumsy messed up big time. And the episode then ultimately becomes about her meeting her future self and mm -hmm. her future self getting to kind of make amends, I guess, for yeah. getting to kind of come to terms with the trauma that she suffered when her mother disappeared and, and relearning about her own motherhood and how she interacts with her kids. And there was something really quite poignant about that. I got that kind of twilight zone sort of sense from it, even something like The Outer Limits. But what's different there is that The Twilight Zone was an anthology of sci-fi horror kind of stuff. But this feels like an anthology that ties up it kind of reminds me of Lost back in the day. It's got that same focus on different characters and how all these stories kind of intertwine and, and tie up together. And then also, just like you say, these, these big mysterious questions about, you know, what is the loop and who are the establishment and why are these people settled here? And do they know there's life outside of the loop? You know who really kind of adds a sense of horror whenever their face flickers on screen? <laughs> Jonathan Price. Jonathan Price. <laughs> Let me tell you something, this guy, yeah, I know that his, his sort of uh, normal casting might be, you know, cute, granddad, etc. Hell no. When I see this guy on screen, I know it's about to go down. If I walked into a church with my newborn baby and John, I don't have a baby, but if I did, and Jonathan Price was about to, um, what you call it, christen it, we are walking back out those doors because this guy is evil. So see, My voice even broke out so emotional. You're so scared. <laughs> Good evening. 
to have him at the start of episode one doing this very intense, gradually mm. zooming in monologue in a yeah. completely dark room, that gives off vibes to me of, okay, this is the jigsaw equivalent of this series. Do you want to play a game? He's the mastermind, mm. he's pulling the strings, because when you really think about it and you watch these episodes, he's the, he's the only person who really knows what's going on. Even though they don't necessarily do anything to define him as the villain, you just get this very ominous sense that he's up to no good. Everyone in town is connected to the loop in one way or another. And you will come to know many of their tales in time. He is the loop. <gasps> I'm saying it. You heard it he here first. Loop. What a fan, Harry. He is the he loop. Is the loop. I think the big thing for me uh, in summarizing is it makes you ask those questions of what would you do if so, you know, in the first episode, it's clearly if you meet your younger self, I'll put it to you, mm. Money. If you met your younger self, what, what would you have to say? I already know. I would just say, listen, Manya, <laughs> no matter how tempting it is, please, bro, please don't get a mohawk. <laughs> don't get a mohawk. I never it know is... when you're going to be sincere or crack a joke. I was no, just I am thought, being what's he say? deadly serious. A now mohawk. you know. Do you know how when? difficult it is to remove images of you with a mohawk from Google Images? It's impossible, Hazel. Quite, quite difficult, yeah. I'd imagine. I've never. I I've wish never I didn't get a mohawk. Have a mohawk. <laughs> Just a quick note for the editor: if we could pop in a picture no, of my, don't, when you're mohawk, no, that, that I would swear be, to you, I will pay you a kiss. thousand pounds, editor, <laughs> if you do not put a picture of me with a mohawk. in. I swear to I'll God, I'll pay you double. <laughs> what would you tell yourself, Hazel? What would I tell myself? Um. You're asking a cynic. Um, I would say it Sounds gets better. Get I'd, I'd say it gets better. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but like better. <laughs> okay, that's really deep, man. I've just come out here with my mohawk insecurities and you've just Sorry. a real story. You've I would also mohawk. tell her not to get a mohawk. I just don't feel like she needed to hear it. <laughs> It's not just about me and Manya here on Prime Video Club. We want to hear from you guys as well. Um, you can leave a comment on the video. You can hop onto Twitter, hashtag Prime Video Club, and let us know your thoughts on any of these shows or movies or indeed ourselves or whatever the hell it is that you're going through right now. Uh, so we've got this one from Terry E, who says, just finished watching the series. It's absolutely a beautiful masterpiece, maybe nostalgic of shows like Amazing Stories, Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, and Lost. Thank you, Amazon, for an amazing series. And then just lots of emojis. Yeah, I mean, Hazel, that you've just changed your username and wrote that, haven't you? Four <laughs> film references, that's literally four series what? references in one comment. That's, that's, that's you, Hazel. Sounds like a nerd to me. Yeah, no, that's absolutely... I've, I think I've listed most of those shows in this um, episode as well. Twilight Zone, The Outer Limit. It kind of reminds me of Lost. That could be your soulmate and you don't even know. Tell you what, guys, hit me up. My email is... <laughs> <laughs> It's a lonely time and you, you know you've adjusted when you watch the first episode of Tales from the Loop and feel terror at the crowd of people shuffling into the building. Well, just because we're all so used to self-isolating now that when I saw all those people at the beginning, I, there's something in me went, no, <laughs> go home. You're breaking the law. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> that's why I felt so <laughs> peaceful when there was just massive spaces with no one in them. I was like, yeah, that's right. You self-isolate. And don't forget that all of season one of Tales from the Loop is available on Prime now so you can... Go binge all of that, get stuck in, enjoy. We'd love to hear what you think. And in the meantime, we're gonna have a little chat now about another sort of quiet, patient, but slightly more horrific piece, uh, mm. Pan's Labyrinth. I've got the perfect sentence to describe this movie. Do it. It's a fairy tale gone rotten. Oh. Like How good it. is that? I like it. Because one yeah. minute you're seeing fairies flitting around, it's nice and magical. And the next minute, spoiler alert, there's a guy getting his nose bashed in by a bottle. And isn't that what's so great about it though, the whole way through? Like, if I had to pick top line what I love about this film, is it's, mm. it's a fantasy, it's a fairy tale. It's almost, it's a child's film, almost because it's told from the point of view of a child. And it's about a child and her quest, I suppose. She reminds me of like Belle from Beauty and the Beast or Ariel from The Little Mermaid. It's that same sense of like, I'm, I'm stuck in this place. That's, that's quite horrible actually. Mm. And she wants to escape. And so she goes on this sort of, 
this sort of quest where she meets various characters who we're not sure if they're they're good or evil we're not sure what their purpose is or if they're leading her astray but either way she's given these sort of tasks that she has to complete you've got the constant cross-cutting between this very um whimsical fantasy fairy tale world and then the cold harsh reality no the brutal realities in fact of a fascist regime mm. so even when you're momentarily transported into pan's labyrinth and the wonderful creatures within that you're then dragged back into this awful fascist regime where you know they're um you know they're torturing prisoners that they capture mm. and then you've got the captain who's playing mind games right here he is he's got a bit of a captain hook vibe for me i thought mm. also his kind of fascination with time you see a lot about time and watches and clocks um but this I don't know. He really does he's, think he's God, doesn't he? He's not flawless, though, because he's always puffing a cigarette. He needs, he's trying to escape from something. He's got his vices. Yeah, that's so true. And we start to so figure that true. out a little bit later on. He's such a perfectionist. Everything is so orderly, so neat, everything in its place. Like you, you put a child into that world and immediately I'm fearful for her. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, this is Mercedes who befriends uh, Ophelia and sort of becomes a bit of a surrogate mother to her. And she, she's really the only bit of relief I found anyway in the film. From the second we meet him at the beginning, uh, when Ophelia and her mother arrive, he's, um, there's something kind of insidious about him. Like he's not overtly just being horrible, but even the way he's ordering her into the wheelchair and like overly taking care of her. He's not taking care of her. He's taking care of the baby in her belly that is his. And we always, when he's on screen, hear this ticking, which does create this like ticking time bomb. I think effect. that's where the Captain Hook thing came in for me. Yeah, it just reminded I think me so that, too. Yeah. You definitely get a feel about him that time is of the essence. And and it's something, it's it's about proving himself. It's about being the best, being the greatest. <laughs> He won't even be, you know, mocked in, in jest by a friend of his, you know, at, at a dinner table. That, that scene is, again, another example of how he's so menacing, even when it's a quiet mm. thing he's doing and it's not, like, outwardly violent. Habladurías. Nunca tuvo un reloj. So Captain Vidal, not a nice guy. Mm. Where would we put him on the, let's call it the bastardometer of villains? Right. It's if a we're step gonna compare worse him. than the... Step worse than a rectal thermometer, that, isn't it? Um, okay, well, look. Pennywise, okay? Pennywise. Pennywise. Is, Ooh. Oh, yeah, Pennywise goes a step beyond him because Pennywise will become your worst fears. He can do I that. would put Pennywise below him because Pennywise oh. is a little bit more magical and the fact that he's a real guy kind of gets me more. But that's not interesting. I mean, interesting. Pennywise does eat children. He does eat kids. Hans Gruber. What are we thinking from Die Hard? Um, I mean, I've not watched any of the Die Hard films, so I'm not sure about that. I, I, I was planning to do it. To, I was, no, I can't. I, can't was, do this. No. I, I was going to do it today, Hazel. I was. Hazel? Okay, this is a bit of a scientific theory I've got. The sexiness of a villain often correlates to the evilness of the villain. So yeah. let me give you an example. We see yeah. him at the beginning. He's got his hair slicked back. He's a bit Antonio Banderas, isn't he? He's a bit Zorro. He looks like a well put together guy, but I feel like that's what makes him so dangerous. What mm. about American Psycho? Uh, American, not American Psycho. That's a completely different film about bicycles. American Psycho where, you know, again, he's got that routine mm. and he looks pristine and yet he's capable of the biggest atrocities. Yeah. I think there's something to be said about sexy villains doing the worst. The director's making a very clever choice to house this horrible monstrosity in a nice package so that you're sort of a little bit fooled by it, as are the people around this character in the film. And you can kind of see why people are drawn in by him because he's, he's good looking, he's charming, he's handsome, he's powerful, he walks upright and he carries himself well. And, and f by all intents and purposes, he's very polite and well-mannered. And yeah, no, you're totally right. Bang on. I'll tell you who isn't a sexy villain. Go on. The Pale Man. My voice cracks on it. <laughs> I hate him. I hate him. He gives me the heebie-jeebies. I do not, don't like, dislike. Why are your eyeballs there? Stop it. Okay, so context. She's been sent on a quest. She needs to go retrieve a dagger. She's been told not to eat anything in this place. And she's just eaten a grape and awoken this monster. And when we walk mm. into this place, 
the whole place is covered in, it's like adorned in tapestries of images of him just mutilating children. He's not a good guy. His eyeballs are on a plate. Why are they on a plate? And then he puts them in his hands. No. This is peak Mm -mm. Guillermo del Toro. The creaking of the fingers is sending me. Another Stop one. Stop eating the so grapes! What's wrong with you? Go home, child. And her fairies Don't are like, Ophelia. can I stop her? Don't oh, he's so it. wrinkly and saggy. I'm going to guess this is Doug. I'm not sure, but uh, Doug uh, Jones, I think it is, plays a lot of the monsters in Guillermo del Toro stuff. He's the fish guy oh. in Shape of Water. He's been in Buffy and Star Trek and everything. I think that's the skin him. flaps as well. Oh, and then just, spoiler, it's just going to eat the head off this fairy. No. That's her friend. Like in a in a normal fairy tale, they're the little fairies that would protect her and flit around and they'd be fine. No, look at his look. saggy pelvis. Look. What is that? And then he opens his eyes again and he's gonna fall. Oh, her. the it's bloody hands. Ooh. Oh, this whole scene is so tense for me. And it's just oh, the look perfect at the perfect kind of He's got this kind of like chicken neck situation happening as well. All of I thought she was going to be okay because I thought the door was going to stay open and then the door closes. Door closes. What are you going to do, mate? What are you going to do? No, at this point. Ah. No. No. Can't end it there. If you were Ophelia and you were in that banquet, okay, the pale man is sitting at the end Mm -hmm, of the table. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What food would you be willing to risk it all for? I'd have eaten the eyeballs. What's wrong with you? Well, then he can't see me and chase me. That's get rid of the eyeballs. I take it's I'll take it the Not I'm a celeb. Get me out of here. Are you crazy? Just saying Eat it's the a eyeballs. strategic move. He's still gonna find you though. He's just gonna he be able to he kill you. He can't see without them. He's blind. Oh, that's disgusting. I'm so sorry. Why Don't do ask me questions. You will only ever get a dark answer to questions. I'm so I sorry. I thought you were going to say, oh, oh yeah, maybe I'll The cake. I'd eat the jelly. cake one. Is that happy? Is that good for you? Yeah, the jelly. I'd eat the jelly. This film is very good at making us think, okay, who's team Ophelia and who isn't? Who's so M- Mercedes, obviously, she seems to be team Ophelia, but then she's very close to the captain. So is she, a, is she double bluffing? Mm, is she a spy mm. on the inside? That is something I also found unsettling in addition to the massive toads. I got fawn trauma, I'm calling it that. Because is he nice or is this guy super twisted? Is he one of the, the evil ones? Soy un fauna. I was mistrusting of the fawn throughout. I, I was expecting at any minute for him to sort of uh, turn around and reveal himself as the devil. Because even when she asks what his name is, he says, you know, I've been known by many names and I'm like, Lucifer! <laughs> but it turns <laughs> out, you know, he, I think it's, it's all a test and it's, it's very, very, it's just so sad and so heartbreaking, the ending. But for me, it does read as, you know, it was all sort of, and it was all in her imagination, in my head anyway, that's how I yeah. kind of read it, that it was an escape for her from, from the horrors of, of war and fascism. But, um, but towards the end, when she's kind of tested and she takes her baby brother and tries to save him, the fawn asks, would she give up her throne to save the boy? And she says, yes. And it turns out that she dies and the baby is saved. Mm. And if you are to read the fairy tale or the prophecy as being as being true, at the beginning we see that you know she she lives in this other sort of underworld, uh, this sort of mystical, fantastical place, and she was a princess a long time ago who who lost her way and is due back any minute soon. So the king is sort of waiting for her. Yeah. I wonder if that place can only be reached through death. Through death. And so it's sort of her dying at the end is her going back home and the baby gets saved and it's all very sad. I'm name dropping slightly here, but um, I I have I've met Guillermo del Toro oh, twice under go. very strange under very strange uh, circumstances. <laughs> I made a short horror film a couple years ago in the YouTube space, and he was presiding over this like composi- uh, competition as one of the judges. He told me I was very disturbed. Well, I can agree with that. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank I mean, you. We're, we're I'm really really proud of that. There. Really proud of that. Uh, I spoke to him about uh, Shape of Water, and one of the wonderful central themes of that film is who the real monster is, and it's yeah. this kind of running theme for Del Toro, I think, where 
he, he, he subverts that expectation where, you know, in Shape of Water, she meets this sort of creepy, weird lizard guy, but they end up falling in love and he turns out mm. to actually be lovely. And it's the human who's the real monster, the guy who's chasing him, you know, this sort of like Ishmael character. But yeah, so he turns out to be the baddie in that film. And I think you get the same kind of thing here where on the surface, you know, you've got her running from the pale man with the creepy eyes and he, it comes exactly back to what you were saying. Like they look like monsters but Captain Vidal doesn't look like one. He's just sort of, he's a monster yeah. under the surface. I'm like, maybe that's even worse. Let's leave that aside for one second because we've mm -hmm. got the segment you know and love. Listo. It's IMD Bingo! Yes, <laughs> Yay. come on! <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth was shown at Cannes Film Festival. Right. I want you to tell me how many minutes of applause it got. I'm going to give you some multiple Whoa. choice options. Was it five minutes? Mm -hmm. Was it 22 minutes? Or was there a stunned silence? Oi, that's a good question. Right, let me think about it. Yeah, about five minutes. You're imagining that. One, You're just getting into one character. Of that, one minute of that and I'm out for the count. But, okay, mm -hmm. I know it's an impressive film. So what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What am I going to say? I don't think you'd clap at the end of it. I think you'd be like, what? That's not how fairy tales are supposed to end. So I'm going with C, stunned silence. I'm so sorry, you're wrong. Uh, wait, no, no, sorry, sorry. I, I, that was a lag. Um, I, eight, eight. There was a lag? Yeah, yeah, that was a lag. Sorry. I'm I having I, none of it. I'm having none of it. There was 22 mm. minutes, 22 minutes of applause, oh which is gosh. huge. Yeah. I was, in, I was at Cannes minutes. once when that happened at the end of a film and people literally just stand and applause for so. And I was like looking around going, when are we going to stop? And someone was like, no, no, they'll just keep going. I was like, okay, it's, it's two in the morning. by then. I'd be just it, It's exhausting stumps. and weird. I want to know how you think he enacted eating that fairy. Hmm. Okay, well, one thing I noticed was that when the head came off the fairy, there was a lot of string action. Interesting. And I've only ever seen that sort of stringy, pulley action when you're eating a really gooey pizza. So okay. did they, okay, and I'm going out on a limb here, get a green screen pizza and pull the end off it? Tell me that's right. No. Close. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was it? You, you may well have seen this action before. I don't know that for sure. But what they did was they filled a condom full of blood and bit into what, it. What, what is that even meant look, to mean I don't mean know what you're doing with your weekends, <laughs> Monia, and that's, that's, between, that's between you and, and the wall. Well, I, but, I, uh, I can say it now on record. It doesn't involve a condom full of blood, <laughs> Hazel. Next up, so we're talking about Jurassic Park, one of my favourite ever films, certainly one of my favourite Spielberg films, an absolute classic. It's available on Prime and also available from the 1st of May is Greg Daniels' new sci-fi comedy show upload, which we'll be talking about next time. I'm excited for that one, Manya. It's basically set in a world where people can upload their consciousness into like a virtual reality environment. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love those kind of like Little futuristic San could it happen sort of films. Yeah, yeah sort of I'm excited day. for that one. That's it from us for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, please do get involved. Don't forget to subscribe so that you know when our next episode is coming out. Also, you can comment. You can get involved on Twitter in the discussion there with hashtag Prime Video Club. We would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me today. No again. worries, it's been, Hazel. Look, it's been super me fun. and Planty McPlanterson have had a great time with you. Take care of yourself. I'm each gonna other. hop in the bath and watch watch the shows now. Next time so we get back, that's going to have sunglasses and lipstick on it, isn't it? I know. He's going to have a bow tie on. <laughs> I can't so wait. I'll do my bit. You do yours. But yeah, Hazel, look after yourself, yeah? It's been Prime a pleasure. Club, you're legends. I love all of you. Peace. <laughs>